Hey everybody, it's Natalie B. McKenzie, and welcome to the Whole Woman Podcast. This week, we're going to be talking with a lifetime committed man who is a marriage and family therapist, entrepreneur, author, and relationship marriage expert. His dream is to be a dad, and that dream to be fulfilled is built with a legacy from his father passed on to him. Ladies and gentlemen, help us welcome Chris A. Matthews. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. We are so happy to be chatting with you at a time when so many things are happening in our society. And boy, do we need to hear from a therapist. But interestingly enough, I looked at your bio and one of the things that really got my attention is your statement that every dad has a dream. And I wonder what that really means to you, because that's not the first thing I would think of when I look at someone. Of course, we in this society do not give a lot of credence to our Black men as being stellar stand-up fathers. Definitely. Yeah, so, so my dream to be a father aligns with my narrative, my story. My wife and I, we uh, conceived early in college and there were a lot of friends that I had who were also becoming dads, but they didn't have that dream of being a father, a husband. They just wanted to be a provider or a support figure. I wanted the whole package. So my dream entailed being able to serve my wife, being able to serve my child and being able to serve an entire family unit and system because that's what my parents awarded me and that's what my parents' parents awarded them. So that's where the dream comes from. <laughs> you mentioned your father, you mentioned your parents, Chris. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about where you're from. Give us just a quick synopsis on your background so we can create a landscape as to wh what that context is and how it impacts how you conduct your business of living, fatherhood, and as a therapist. Yes, I'm the youngest of three ch children, uh, born and raised in Charlotte, North Carolina. So being in a Southern state, there were um, a lot of different things that uh, influenced who I am now, the hospitality, Southern hospitality, being well-mannered, uh, seeing sides that were conservative, but yet having liberal parents who uh, made sure that I understood the value of inclusion. So making sure everyone was included, making sure that there were some fundamental values that were passed down through their parenting and being respectful to uh, women, having a sister, being close to my mother, making sure that I understood the value of family. And family is the foundation for what I do in my career as a mental health counselor, as a marriage counselor, as a substance abuse counselor, all of the different therapies that I participate in delivering all stem from systemic de delivery and care. So that's who I am at my core <laughs> and family is everything to me. You know, Chris, it, it, without trying to be um, real intellectual, family is the core and the foundation of any solid society. Mm -hmm. And so you are right lock and step with what is required to have a healthy functioning community. Mm -hmm. So Talk to me about how you decided to be a, a therapist, a family therapist, a marriage therapist, and how that aligns with you being a young dad, because here you are giving the story, you got pregnant at a young age, you and your wife were both in college. How did you navigate that with getting your academic career going so as not to derail your professional career by being early parents? Yeah, so love and love is a word that we hear and a lot of times we align it with a feeling, but love is an action. My wife and I had to learn how to love each other through our actions. We were in colleges that were three hours apart. So every weekend, come Thursday, I got in my car, I drove to her school and we began to develop that family based off of the actions of love, the dedication, the commitment. She had my son... Um, for the most part during the week by herself. So she's having to go to college. She worked a part-time job while also being a mother. I'm working two jobs back in Charlotte. And the 
rigor and the determination to believe in each other. And we were also developing our relationship, our friendship. And I tell a lot of people, I parent through my marriage. Mm -hmm. I parent through the system of having the connectivity and the relationship with my wife, that teamwork. I believe that when we look at the black family, just having written an article for Juneteenth, you know, blacks are one of the, the few that have a whole system when it comes to raising parent, I mean, raising children, um, Latinos and whites, they outnumber us when it comes to two parent households. Yes. And I believe that if we as, as a people of black folk, if we're going to uh, rise up, we need to be more intentional about the relationships that we establish with our intimate partners, because we can love through a marriage. We can parent through a marriage. And that's what I'm preaching and teaching and helping other couples and families do. And family looks so unique now, right? We have blended families. There's so many different types of families. And, and that's the thing, that definition of family now can be expanded. It doesn't have to just be traditional. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things I did when I was in my graduate studies is I wrote a research paper on non-residential African-American fathers. And quality is bigger than quantity. So the quality of time that we spend with the family has to be outlined. You know, you mentioned Juneteenth, and um, it's interesting because you can't say Juneteenth without flashes of slavery coming in. And here we are talking about marriage, family, the foundation of a society, of any healthy community. Mm -hmm. How would you say that the 21st century family is still reeling, healing, being impacted by the ills of slavery that was designed to rip the family apart? The, the biggest impact, well, there the are two. The, the first is going to be the lack of self-love. When, when people are ripped apart and there's this individualistic perspective, this push down your throat, you, you tend to think it's all about you and what you need and what you want. But Black folk, we're communal. We, we thrive in a communal system. We thrive working together, but we've been taught lies and been told that we don't work together. And we'll hear these uh, notions a lot of times when we work with a black professional, we might say, mm, I don't know about the quality, right? We, we, we've been taught to question ourselves. So if we can begin to first love ourselves and love our brothers and our sisters. At that point, we can rebuild what was lost because we are people who need each other. And I believe that in order to truly love someone else, you have to first learn how to love yourself. And that's what the mental health is about, learning how to love and be comfortable with you so you can then have the ability to love and be comfortable with others. You know, mental health has become such a buzzword. Mm -hmm. I, I don't even like that term, um, especially during these pandemic days, um, being isolated during the you know, predominantly past two years, um, year and a half, the first part of 2021 and all of 2020. How have you seen that impact? Those in your community, those that you serve, those that come into your mental health center? Yeah, so isolation hurt a lot of people. And we took relationships for granted. The pandemic reminded us of the value of community, the value of being able to go to your religious institution and connect with other people, the value of going into your workplace and just seeing a coworker and having that, that water cooler talk, the value of your recreational sports leagues, the value of going out with other families and the cookouts and the hangouts. And that's what really hurt a lot of people. The minimization of socialization has created that mental health buzzword because mental health doesn't always look like a severe disorder. It doesn't look like all of the disorders. It can just simply look like a mild sense of sadness or stress or tension. And we as a nation, we as a world, we're under a lot of stress. We have this unknown virus coming around attacking people. Most individuals can't pinpoint someone they don't know they didn't lose a family member based on COVID. Hmm. So we're now coming together to 
to open up as a society, open up as people so we can begin to heal up. And that's what the mental health is about in my office. It's about people coming in, feeling safe, feeling not judged, feeling comfortable enough to open up. And then that's how they're able to heal up. I, I, I like that. They come in to open up so they can heal up. You mentioned your office again. And, and you know, Chris, you are a bona fide therapist with your own practice. Tell us about that journey. Um, when I look at your bio, I see you attended UNC, your mom attended UNC, your dad attended. It's a whole family tradition for you. And you went on to further studies and you're properly credentialed well prepared to do what you do and you own your own mental health facility give us an insight into your background and really some tools that we can use as we're dealing with our neighbors our families our friends as we're trying to cope with the ever-changing dynamics and stressors that are coming at us today definitely so the first part of your question my journey began based on uh, my grandfather he was very big on education so all of my family members were told from day one, you go to college, you get a degree. And we looked at a degree not as just a cloud of having the degree. It was more about making sure that you have the training to be an expert in your craft. And there's a responsibility that comes with working with people. So my undergrad was in public health at UNC Charlotte. I then transitioned and got a master's in leadership and organizational development because I knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And then I got a second master's in marriage and family therapy. And I chose to go to marriage and family therapy route because I wanted to be a systemic based thinker, a systemic based therapist. And that's what marriage and family therapy is about. We believe that the system is greater than the individual parts. As it relates to my entrepreneurship journey, I like to have the fluidity and freedom to explore different counseling modalities to work with different populations and not be pigeonholed based on a funding stream. So that's why I opened up a private practice and I got into mental health also when I started to work with substance abuse clients. Now, when you ask the second part of that question, what can we do? What can the listeners do to help with mental health? And it starts with giving a simple gift. And that gift is the ability to listen to someone with no judgment. We're so quick to want to engage in dialogue that's a debate or challenge or question someone else's thoughts. What happens if we just simply practice active listening, hearing what you say, hearing the person speak and repeating back what they said, right? That's a simple technique that we can do to help individuals feel safe and comfortable and heard. People just want to feel heard. That is so important, feeling heard. And I think, especially during the pandemic, we didn't even know what we wanted to say. We just knew that this wasn't working and we had no one to talk to. Yes. We had no one to talk with. And especially, and I, you know, it, it's such a stereotype, but in the African-American community, we do not, we do not really recognize and respect that mental health is as important as being cancer-free. Being healthy mentally is as important as a cancer-free diagnosis. That we needing to express our emotions, something in our community is somehow offended by expression of feelings. Definitely. If it's not just saying you're happy and my husband and I are very different. I am very vocal. If someone's, if something makes me unhappy, I will say that displeases me. That doesn't make me feel good. That doesn't mean I hold a grudge. It just means I express that that doesn't work and I expect it to be respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have been taught from an early age, if you think about certain things that kids are, are told in our community to be seen and not heard, <laughs> that goes on as an adult and prevents you from having the freedom to express yourself because you don't think anybody wants to hear what you have to say. So it, it really boils down to making sure we provide people a space to simply be heard. Everybody wants to be heard. We all have a voice and it's all about how we use it. You know, Chris, 
don't move. This is getting really good. I really want to keep diving into this, but we've got to take a quick break. So sit tight. We'll be right back. Announcing the Mocha Podcast Network, an innovative lifestyle podcast network featuring conversations from a Black perspective. Curated with respected voices led by actresses and comedians Sherry Shepard and Kim Whitley. We're funny and we have a yes. point of view. We call that edge of That's what we call it. Is that what it is? Veteran TV journalist Rolanda Watts. Shocking the heck out of everybody. The legendary Funky Divas in Vogue. This topic is girl groups in the industry. To syndicated broadcast personalities, Lonnie Love and Dee Dee McGuire, as well as an array of experts and activists. Mocha Podcast Network, a lifestyle destination with authentic voices and perspectives designed to enrich and empower women of color with a unique listening experience. More than a destination, the Mocha Podcast Network is a full-service studio that offers an ongoing portfolio of production, distribution, marketing, guest booking, and most importantly, ad sales. With a unique revenue model for podcasters that includes customized promotional campaigns created specifically around podcaster and targeted audience, service social media promos and pushes, MPN brand advertising, targeted electronic newsletter, experienced sales representation. For advertisers, the Mocha Podcast Network is a safe marketplace to align their brands with trusted voices, organically engaging the highly in-demand female consumer and more. With quality over quantity, from concept to completion, now is the time for content creators and brands to join the innovative Mocha Podcast Network and experience unapologetic conversations with a new perspective. Welcome back to the Whole Woman Podcast. I'm Natalie B. McKenzie. Today, we're talking with Chris Matthews. He's a licensed marriage family therapist, and we're talking about mental health. We have been discussing the importance of using your voice, expressing yourself, and for us to be heard. Welcome back, Chris. Thanks for having me. Chris, where are you practicing? So I practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I also practice globally, virtually as well. And I do coaching globally and I do counseling in my state. And the difference is when you're a therapist that's licensed, you have to practice counseling within the state, but coaching is non-regulated. So I can do coaching across the globe virtually. And I have clients on both platforms. And I'm also sure that with the pandemic, where geographic boundaries were really broken down, it yes. opened up um, a wider um, um, opportunity for you to reach more people in need. Tell us about, um, tell me the name of your practice, because I think that is. Yeah, Relationship Counseling Group, PLLC is the name of the practice. It's myself, and then I supervise uh, three other clinicians that are also available to see clients virtually and in person as well. How have you seen a shift in the demand for your services since the start of the pandemic? And how is that unfolding today as we seem to be getting closer to an endemic stage? So the biggest shift has been from quantity to quality. So before the pandemic, there was a large number of people seeking out mental health services and what have you. Now the quality has changed. We're seeing an uptick because all of our clinicians are licensed and all of our clinicians also focus on the systemic delivery of care. And as a marriage and family therapist, I'm one of the few professions that is trained to work with couples starting from graduate level, graduate level practice. Marriage and family therapists have to amass over 500 hours of clinical delivery before we can even have an associate level license. And we also have to have the majority of our hours with two or more people. So a lot of therapists may say they work with couples, but they don't have any experience and they weren't mandated to get that experience. 
So the quality has been the biggest shift. People are seeing now that all therapists aren't made alike and they're doing more research to determine who to go see. So they're not getting hurt by working with someone that's maybe a coach with no credentialing, no regulation, and doesn't have any continuing um, care hours required to be able to deliver the services. That's the biggest shift I'm seeing. So uh, let me understand, um, especially for our listeners, as a therapist, what is the differentiator versus that of a coach? So the coach doesn't have any regulatory body that says you need to have this amount of training. You need to have these amount of continuing education training hours. There's no uh, follow up with with a therapist, a counselor. You're going to know that they have the appropriate training, the experiential hours that are required, the expertise. They're not just going to be giving you what they think or how they feel. They're going to provide you with information is research based, theory based. It's going to be more than just their personality or their opinions. A coach is going to predominantly be solution oriented, solution focused. The coach is not going to go back into your family of origin. They're not going to go back into the issues that might have created the problems. They're just going to give you practical solutions and fixes that are going to be more surface level. Those are the primary differences. And so how are you as a therapist able to toggle that when you are working with out-of-state clients? So the good part about being both a therapist and a coach, my skills are my skills. So despite the hat, I'm not going to water down the skill set. That's just, you know, <laughs> the biggest thing. Now, what we would like to see, and a lot of therapists are advocating for this, we want to see no borders. And no borders looks like the ability to deliver therapeutic services. And a lot of it aligns with billing because I don't take any insurances. Mm-hmm. I don't have a third party regulator that I have to send a code in in order to get compensated. So it's really about the politics of how does the therapist get reimbursed? And that's why the licensing and the coding is there. But I'm not big on the diagnostic component. My goal isn't to tell you what the problem is in terms of giving you a label. I want to make sure that you have the skills and the tools to cope and deal with the problem. So, so you know, I don't take insurance. I don't do any billing. And I'm not diagnosing clients because that's the stigma that people are talking about. You got people that have a diagnosis based on a therapist that they saw who didn't even tell them what the diagnosis was because they wanted to just file the billing with the insurance. Oh, Jesus. So educating the public also helps debunk the stigmas. Got it. So as a father, a husband, and a relationship therapist, you made time to author a book. And I like the name of the book. It's Finding Your Relationship Fix. Four Reasons Couples Seek Counseling. And as I looked at that, I thought, what percentage of us as couples are truly seeking counseling? And are we waiting until we're at the breaking point or are we seeking counseling so we can cohabitate and build healthy, long lasting relationships? Yeah, I'm so glad you mentioned that. So the book is designed as an opportunity for people who are in any stage of relationship to understand the value of counseling. Counseling doesn't have to be something you go to just because there's an issue. There's actually a greater success level to utilize counseling before the small problem becomes the big problem. So that looks like the premarital phase. And if you're married, you know there's not a book given when you get married. There's no pamphlet, right? You don't even get a pamphlet. Uh, No. (laughs) So, So my goal of the book was to outline the four things that I've seen over the course of my career. There's really four reasons that are aligned with four feelings that lead people into counseling. And if you think of a particular issue, some of the issues you hear are finances, intimacy, infidelity, child rearing. All of the issues stem across four feelings. And those four feelings are people want to feel safe, heard, understood, loved and cared for. And I go in that order because if you can't feel safe with a person, how are you going to communicate? If you don't communicate, 
then how are you going to stand understand each other? If you don't understand each other, how are you going to truly love each other? Wow. Um, I feel like this is a whole nother, you, you're opening up a whole other, you know, space for us to talk about, but you keep going back to love. And when I think of the society um, that we're currently experiencing today, because we are our society, it's the people that make it up. The society mm -hmm. is not apart from us. Mm -hmm. Somehow I feel in communicating with one another, we fail to start with love. Hence, we see ourselves with one mass shooting after the other, just a rash of gun violence and hatred towards one another, unkind words, mean-spirited behavior, divisive communication, whether it's political or it's, uh, it, it's, it's, it all starts from a lack of love. Mm -hmm. How are you as a therapist helping your clients to adapt, adjust, or cope with some of these negative experiences in our community? Yeah, so the first thing, when you, when you look at helping people cope with all these negative experiences, it's, it's really about understanding that there's more good than bad. I, I've recently had the opportunity to travel to uh, Egypt. I took my family to, to Egypt, Cairo, Egypt for a vacation. And what I realized is that we have to look beyond just American culture. There are a lot of places that hold love, self-care, family, community at a high mark. And we can learn from these other cultures. We can learn. I, I remember going into the pharmacy in Egypt and in Cairo. And there was a guy that came in, he paid for the medicine. The pharmacist shut, shut the whole shop down, administered the medicine. The patrons in the shop came over. They began to speak to this man, cheer him up. They served him water. They propped his feet up. And I asked my guide, I said, do, do they know this person? And he said, yes, that, that's their brother. And I said, oh, that's their brother. And he looked at me and he said, Chris, we're all brothers and sisters. So if we can take that same story to America, imagine if we could look at everybody in our country as your brother, as your sister. That's going to be the love I'm talking about. The ability to see everything as a whole, not the individual parts. That systemic work in which I'm trained to do. Helping people see the bigger picture, how we're all connected. That's love. Wow. You know, wow. So they stopped to, A, serve him. First, they recognized him. They acknowledged him. They met his need. They served him. And then provided comfort. You know, it's it's just so basic when you talk about the four things that we need. We want to feel safe. We want to be heard. We want to be cared for. Mm -hmm. um, Chris, what do you see for us on the horizon as we are evolving out of this pandemic we're once again getting back together um, people are starting to gather on mass how do you see us healing as a country because it seems we keep finding one more thing to set us apart versus that thing that brings us together there's still hope there there's a hope that the generations that are coming up will be different than the ones that in the past that, that are here now because they're learning from the past generation. The new generations are learning from the past generations. I look at my son's schools and the diversity. I look at the sports teams and how people are coming together. There's a lot of camaraderie. I, I look at my faith-based community and I see the members coming together despite the hardship, despite all of what you might see on the TV or the media presents there's still a lot of love. There's still a lot of people coming together and that hope, that faith that things will get better. We will come out of this. Our country will come out of this. We will become stronger. I believe that Americans, I believe that persons of color, I believe everyone is going to come together and we have to believe in that. We have to have the hope. We have to keep faith. And it's the little things. You talked about earlier, what can you do? Give the gift of listening. Give the gift of simply listening 
to your neighbor, your family, your colleague, your coworker, your friend, your partner. Just listen. Wow. Chris Matthews, ladies and gentlemen, a licensed family marriage therapist. You are, <clears throat> you're hitting it spot on. Your demeanor is so calming. You have a very positive outlook. And I can only think that what you are offering your clients, if we could expand that on a larger basis, and I'm very happy to hear you say you now have a global practice. How can we get a hold of you? Where can we find you? Um, your yeah, website, so, all that information, tell us. So my website is my name, um, Chris A. Matthews dot com c h r i s a mm -hmm. matthews m a t t h e w s dot com mm -hmm. and for churches organizations that are seeking to have me come in and do any workshops or trainings uh, double exposure angelo elderly elder b through double exposure they do all the booking for events and things of that nature and uh, conferences as well i, I want to get this message out globally that's my that's my mission right now it would be, I think, only an additive and such a blessing for us to be able to get you on a larger stage for the rest of us to recognize that, yes, we are different. There are things that make us all different. We're all unique. But you said it and you said there's one thing that keeps us all the same and it's love. Everybody wants to be heard. Everyone wants to feel safe. Everyone wants to be valued. Chris Matthews, I think talking with you today has set the tone for my day, my week, and moving forward. Thank you for the reset, my brother. We appreciate you and what you do. I love the fact that there is a book available, and I am going to strongly recommend. Is it available on Amazon? It is. It's available on Amazon and also through my website. So it's finding your relationship fix, yep. the four reasons couples seek counseling. And I'm going to say to that single woman, that single guy, that young woman, that um, older retired person, whatever, get the book. Because I find if you really spend time focusing on how you can behave positively in a relationship, it only helps to improve your own well-being. And mental health is no shame. No labels are needed. Just seek help and someone to speak with. We have been talking with Chris A. Matthews, author, family therapist, more importantly, husband, dad, good man, I like you, Chris. I look forward to talking with you again. And again, he's an author. The name of his book is Finding Your Relationship Fix, The Four Reasons Couples Seek Counseling. You've been listening to The Whole Woman Podcast. I'm Natalie B. McKenzie, and I wish you enough life to live, enough love to give, enough joy to share. I wish you enough. Be well. Thank you for listening to The Whole Woman Podcast with Natalie B. McKenzie. Special thanks to Sheila Eldridge and the Mocha Podcast Network and the Whole Woman team, executive producer Deidre and Tate, producer Erica Lauren Ortiz, production assistant Damian Wilson, with music by Ray Chu and wardrobe by Hope Void Designs. So follow us on Instagram at the underscore whole woman and on Facebook, The Whole Woman. And visit our website at TWW thewholewoman.com Announcing the Mocha Podcast Network, an innovative lifestyle podcast network featuring conversations from a black perspective. Curated with respected voices led by actresses and comedians Sherry Shepard and Kim Whitley. We're funny and we have a yes. point of view. We call that edge of That's what we call it. Is that what it is? Veteran TV journalist Rolanda Watts. Shocking the heck out of everybody. The legendary Unky Divas in Vogue. This topic is girl groups in the industry. To syndicated broadcast personalities, Lonnie Love and Dee Dee McGuire, as well as an array of experts and activists. Mocha Podcast Network, a lifestyle destination with authentic voices and perspectives designed to enrich and empower women of color with a unique listening experience. More than a destination, the Mocha Podcast Network is a full-service studio that offers an ongoing portfolio of production, distribution, marketing, guest booking, and most importantly, ad sales. 
with a unique revenue model for podcasters that includes customized promotional campaigns created specifically around podcaster and targeted audience, service social media promos and pushes, MPN brand advertising, targeted electronic newsletter, experienced sales representation. For advertisers, the Mocha Podcast Network is a safe marketplace to align their brands with trusted voices, organically engaging the highly in-demand female consumer and more. With quality over quantity, from concept to completion, now is the time for content creators and brands to join the innovative Mocha Podcast Network and experience unapologetic conversations with a new perspective.